Now Talk Real Estate, sponsored by Boston Connect Real Estate Services. Hi, I'm Shara McNamara, and you are listening to Talk Real Estate. Let me share a little bit about my background before we get started. I am the broker owner of Boston Connect Real Estate, located on the South Shore, and I have been working as a full-time realtor and sales and marketing consultant for home buyers and home sellers for the past 15 years. My unique approach to assisting my clients to the next chapter of their lives is driven by being a team player and by offering them continuous training, education, advising, and mentoring. Every week, I will be providing you with real estate topics ranging from home buyer and home seller advice, legal matters, insurance binders, flood insurance concerns, home inspection questions, environmental worries like radon, lead paint, and mold, mortgages and loan programs, staging tips and ideas, real estate contracts, market trends, home values, and more. It's a talk radio show, and you can follow along online. If you have any questions during the show, please call 781 781- 837-4900. We love to talk real estate. If you missed any of our shows, you can listen on my podcast at talkrealestateradio.com. If you would like a one-on-one consultation with me regarding your home sale or your home purchase, you can connect with me anytime at bostonconnect.com or 781-826-8000. Now, sit back, relax, take good notes, and let's talk real estate. And hello to all our social media. Ooh, that was a little weird. <laughs> Hello to all our South Shore neighbors. You are listening to Talk Real Estate Roundtable with Boston Connect Real Estate's broker team. My name is Melissa Wallace and I'm here with my team members, Sharon McNamara. Hello, 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 hello. Hello. I let you take the lead tonight and like you almost choked. (laughs) Well, first I can't hear myself either. So I'm like, am I on? And then I heard myself like doubling, echoing. So I'm like, all right, I guess I'm double on. on. Yeah. Um, I'm also here with Mary Baker. Hi. Hi. Hello. Yeah. And she said right before the show, I'm in a fantastic I mood. <laughs> I was thinking the little mermaid. Like, I don't know who I think I am. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we are joined by our newest team member, Dustin Hughes. He's mm-hmm. actually in the room next door. <laughs> I know. How long is he the newest? Is it like always until we ha- get somebody else on our team? Maybe. I mean, I feel like I was the new kid <laughs> for the past for four years. <laughs> um, so, and to, we also have a guest, right? Yes, we do. We ha- do have Josh Cutler joining us. I don't know if he can hear us just yet. Yes, you can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Perfect. So we have a couple updates from Josh Cutler. He is the Massachusetts State Rep for the 6th District in Plymouth County. Um, okay, I want to get this right every single time. You did. Pretty you good got it. I want to get the towns right, though. Pembroke, Duxbury, and Hanson. Yeah. You got okay. it. Yes. There we go. It only took me like 15 weeks. Yeah, and not, we missed you last week, Josh. I mean, it was it was a struggle trying to you know keep the show together, but we did I'm it. I'm sure your ratings tanked. Yeah, <laughs> star of the show is that. Yeah, right. No, just kidding. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, guys. Good to see you guys again virtually. Glad, yeah. uh, glad we're be able to sort of talk semi normally about back to real estate kind of topics, which is nice after. All the COVID well, discussions. Tonight's topic, by the way, is disclosures. So I'm sure that you have a lot of fun things that you could probably put into that uh, conversation. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Disclose, disclose. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I know you got a, a packed show tonight, and I just wanted to give a quick update. Um, uh, Governor Baker today extended the um, evictions and mor- mortgage foreclo- foreclosure uh, provisions. He extended. They were due to expire August 18th, and he's extended that to October 17th. Um, so under the law that was passed, he had uh, up to 90 days that he could extend it to. He chose to do it for an extra 60 days. Um, mm-hmm. So that will remain in effect um, for residential tenants and for small uh, business tenants uh, to protect them from evictions and mortgage foreclosures through, um, again, through October 17th. Uh, he does have the ability at that point to then extend for another 90 days. I don't know if that's in the cards right now. Obviously, I think um, probably too, too soon to say. So what is the full, like the description of the law for all of our listeners out there? So basically, what is it? it, If you can't pay your rent, you don't have to? No, you do have to pay your rent still. uh, Although, you know, that would be nice for some folks. Uh, But uh, so the law suspends most residential and small business commercial evictions, Mm -hmm. as well as residential foreclosures. Uh, It does not does not relieve tenants or homeowners obligations to pay rent or 
to make mortgage payments. Um, it does prevent landlords from sending notifications to threaten eviction or to threaten termination of a lease. Mm -hmm. It does limit court actions for what's called non-essential evictions. Mm -hmm. um, it does allow landlords to use their uh, last month's rent to pay for certain expenses uh, if, if uh, they notify the tenant. Uh, and it does allow, uh, it does require lenders, commercial lenders to grant uh, a forbearance of up to 180 days if a homeowner is experiencing a financial hardship uh, due to COVID. I think that's important. Uh, and we've talked about this. I, I remember talking about this way, way back, maybe in March or April when one of the first times I was on your show. I think at the time, folks may have been under a misapprehension uh, about um, forbearances. In this case, uh, they would not simply just stack up and you'd have to owe all that money, you know, 180 days later. They would apply at the end of your mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, so that does provide a little bit more relief um, in, in some folks' situations. So so those provisions, those protections which were passed uh, earlier this summer were extended by Governor Baker today, again, through uh, October 17th. Just to be clear, it does not relieve. You still have to pay your rent, you still have to pay your mortgage. If you can't pay your mortgage, you can apply for a forbearance. Um, and non-essential eviction. There is a, a, a term, uh, a halt to non-essential evictions. Sorry to interrupt, Representative, but we do got to check traffic with Lisa. All right. So I think what he said in that mumbled terms was that Lisa um, is out there. Um, so he's going to give us a traffic report. So why don't we just jump over to Lisa real quick, and then we'll be back with Josh Cutler. We'll be right there. Well, thanks, Sharon. The expressway southbound is slow from Freeport Street towards Granite Ave. Northbound's a nine-minute ride from Braintree to Boston. Route 3 south, looking at 39 minutes to go from the expressway through Plymouth. The Sagamore and the Bourne are both delay-free, and Route 24 south is moving along from 93 to 495. This report is sponsored by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has been at the forefront of inflammatory bowel disease research and care for over 50 years years. Learn more about research, education, and support at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. Traffic on the nines every morning. I'm Lisa DeMilo in the WATD Traffic Center. We now return to Talk Real Estate, sponsored by Boston Connect Real Estate Services on 95.9 WATD. Hello to all our South Shore neighbors. This is Sharon McNamara. You are, of course, listening to Talk Real Estate Roundtable with my team here. I have Mary Baker, Melissa Wallace. Mary's in a good mood, so hold on, everybody. You better watch <laughs> out. Um, we also have Dustin, uh, who's with us. And, of course, we have Josh Cutler, who is with us, giving us a little update. And we were just sort of talking off here just with the forbearance with the mortgages. I know that there were a lot of people that were confused about that because, they're like, all right, I'm not paying this month, this month, this month, but didn't fully understand that the banks were sort of, you know, wanted all three months at the end of it. So that was some confusion. And then I know in the city, uh, there was some, a lot of issues, especially when the kids all just picked up and left, you know, they thought, hey, this is what Governor Baker said. We don't have to pay it. You can't force us out. So as much as we're saying you have to pay your rent, people are definitely reading into that. Now, I wonder what's going to happen. And Josh, I'm just curious if you've heard anything. I know my daughter, Mackenzie, who works at Clemson University, they've been everyday meetings. I can't believe it. Like how many meetings they're having about housing. I wonder if there are going to be stipulations put back into the leases for these kids who are renting, because what if they don't go back after Thanksgiving again? So I don't know. Have you heard anything about that? I know it's in the city and you know, not your your playground, but any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I I've seen a lot of the same things. Uh, you know, have a, a, a someone going off to, to UMass Amherst uh, this fall, and so certainly going through that. Um, and so I don't I don't think we know. I mean, the, the, this action by the governor, and you know, I, I, and he, he made it very clear that you know this doesn't relieve anyone of their obligation to pay rent. I understand that some people may have you know tried to, to use that. Uh, it does it does prevent, and this is perhaps where some of the confusion lies it does prevent uh landlords from reporting late fees uh -huh. and, and 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 taking negative credit reporting actions so um so the the, the you know the normal rec your recourse for for a late uh rent payment you know isn't there but there still is the obligation to pay the rent um in terms of boston you know tenants uh i mean that's uh you know that's something that would be agreed uh -huh. to between the, the landlord and the tenant but um i'm not aware of any broader yeah. movement on that so uh, G-Bar had, a, um, what did they have? They had a town meeting with Marty Walsh uh, just last week. We watched it. 
and it was all about you know different things that's happening in the city mm -hmm. and you know we're seeing different articles too that we don't believe in that they're saying that people aren't they are not leaving the city to come back to, you know to the south shore but we're seeing something awesome. completely <laughs> different so i think that that's bad news for the city but really good news for Hanson and Dr. Yeah, I, was just gonna say, I know some of my interns are not are, you know are, are doing remote classes and they're staying local probably saving some you know money on on room and board and and um mm -hmm. just that's some of our college interns just, just speaking anecdotally <laughs> but definitely an awesome. issue any other updates that you wanted to clue us in on or talk about? Sure. Uh, we had, you know, we've been talking a lot with uh, Division of Unemployment and Division of Pandemic Unemployment. We've had a number of calls. A lot of those issues about uh, identification, a lot of them have been resolved, not all of them. Um, we're still working on that. Um, I, I can inform folks that uh, they've increased the staff there from 15 up to 24 to handle those identification issues that had been, um, you know, we'd seen some fraudulent claims, so to, more mm -hmm. people to, to handle that. Um, and I can say one bit of good news here, the uh, last week there were 20,000 uh, DUA, PUA claims, which is a lot, but contrast to early March when in one week there was 180,000. Wow. So, um, so that's a significant uh, decline mm -hmm. since, since March uh, in, in unemployment claims. So. Obviously, still a lot of folks that are impacted, but um, but at least going in the right direction. And that additional six hundred dollars ends when this week, next week? It does yeah, and that's you know the latest discussion is whether Congress is going to extend or reauthorize that. But as of now, they have not not taken that action. What that do you would, think? That would require Congress to to act. So what do you think? Do you think they'll do it? Give us the download. Uh, you know, I don't. <laughs> I'm not. A, I'm no. I'm certainly no expert on that. I think it's tough to get the House and Senate in D.C. to agree on things. Um, <laughs> So my, I wouldn't bet on it, but you never know. Yeah, I know. All right. Well, it seems like it's it's nice to see, you know, things sort of happening. Um, I was talking, I went and got my nails done this week and she said, oh, it's still very slow. Um, so there's probably still people that are a little nervous and everything. Yeah. But it seems, you know, our new normal is normal. Like walking around with the mask seems, it's just getting used to it. Yeah, it seems. And you've been saying that since, you know, 20 weeks ago, yeah. whenever that was. So... Any other things that um, I know one other update you should give us is uh, tell us more about elections. I did get something in the mail this oh, week. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did everybody get their uh, little postcard in the mail? I if did. you're a registered voter, you should have gotten the postcard by now. I think they're still mailing a few of them out so that maybe some folks in the audience who haven't got it yet. But um, that goes to every registered voter in Massachusetts. And it's not a ballot, just to be clear. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a request for a ballot. So if you want to vote by absentee, you just fill it out. There's no postage required. Just mail it back. It's all good. If you're a traditionalist and you want to vote in person, that's your, your God-given right, and you have every ability to do that. And we also have, uh, for folks who like to vote in person, but maybe do it a little bit early, we'll have uh, in-person voting, early voting by in person, where you can go into your town hall two weeks prior to the election. So three different ways to go, but uh, the the uh, application forms did go out this past week for folks. Um, yeah, that's exciting. I'm going to yeah. fill mine out, because I told you last week, I'm, I'm just going to fill it out regardless. And then if I, because remember Josh said last week, if we choose to go in person, we still can, you know, it's just, I want to see it what's happening. Recommend it, no, it doesn't still, recommend it, but still. Yeah. I mean, You're going to have the town clerks be yelling at me again, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> you, that disclaimer out there. you did not recommend no, that, Josh. We, we mumble, we mumble thank you, Mary. It. Mary, thank you. <laughs> don't worry, we don't let the town clerks listen. <laughs> <laughs> They're so. wonderful people, so we, we want to help them as much as we can. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. But I think it's exciting, though. Maybe we will get more people to vote, and I think that that's really important, oh, too. So, so. Sure. And getting more people absolutely. excited about, you know, politics, whether it's at a local level, state level, or national level. So I think that that's really important. Well, Josh, thank you so much. Um, we know that you will be on the ballot. I'm going to say that every week. I know it's getting old. <laughs> know that there yeah. was a letter that went out that said perhaps you were not. He is. <laughs> you heard it here. You got my vote. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Look at that. I think he Thanks, does it. Oh, you got three. That's three right here. The, 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 we're, 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 you we're rolling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh, we'll see you next week. And uh, stay safe. Thank you. You too. Take care. Right, bye, bye, Josh. Bye. So that was Josh Cutler, and he's great. He's been so good about coming like on every week. Now. He is like he's our just, buddy. He's like yeah. our buddy. Yeah, it's he's good. He's he's so informative, and he's just so level headed. I like that about mm -hmm. him. You know, um, and you know, at the beginning, he, they had to give some really like not easy news. You know, so um, I'm sure his phone was ringing off the hook. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. So we're lucky that we have him on WATD here. Uh, you are listening to Talk Real Estate Roundtable with the McNamara Broker Team here at Boston Connect Real Estate. And uh, we have our next guest that's going to be joining us. And who would like, Mary, you're in a good mood. Do you want to introduce mm-hmm. our next guest? <laughs> yeah, but I always, I always don't do well on your last name. Amy, I love you so much. But it's, so it's Amy Massifer, right? Massifer. Massifer. We can't hear you, Amy. Amy, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. There we go. Oh, you're good. Okay. It's, um, it's Amy Hubert Mass Frere with the Mass Frere ever trailing off. <laughs> so, <laughs> still, like, still working on that, but yes, Amy Hubert Mass Frere. Hubert, you uh, can do that one. Amy Hubert. I know. I know. I actually had a harder time with the Hubert, I think. No, well, I actually sent her a text today. I was like, have we have dropped it yet or not? <laughs> no, we've, we've dropped it for sure. But, <laughs> but it, it's tricky when you have kids, right? It's like, yeah. you know, um, hyphen, what, what do you do? I don't know. I'd like to just go to like a symbol at some point, maybe like an asterisk, and that'll just be my name. We'll just call you Amy. Like, sort of I like. No, that's, that's really like the genuine, that's. I'm just Amy. <laughs> just Amy. That is tricky. And yeah. Amy is with Sherman, right? Yeah, Sherman, I always want to say yes. Sherman, yes. Sherman Law. Uh, located in Hingham, which is great. And uh, we've been working with Amy for years. Um, She always brings a smile to my face. Um, She is very, very smart and um, it has a lot of background of, you know, information that we're going to be talking tonight about disclosures, 20 years of experience. Uh, So she has it all uh, going for her. And we're lucky that she is friends here of the Boston Connect family. And um, I loved earlier, I said to Amy, I'm going to share what you said because you're funny and I love you. And she, I said, um, I was like, just so you know, we'll do Zoom. So you don't even have to bother coming to studio, which is great because she can do it from oh, home. Yeah. Right. And um, I said, I said, just so you know, you will be on, you know, video because people are watching Facebook Live. And she goes, so I don't have time for a cleanse and a spray tan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this is me. This is official. I'm like. You know, I love you when I'm showing up quarantine. I, I like don't even FaceTime my own mother, but here I am <laughs> in my glory. I've like cleaned out a little area and banished the children. Yes. You, know, you might hear the two dogs. Let me know. I have the air conditioning on too. So let me know if that's like giving you a yeah. feedback. We can't hear anything. You're good. I'll yes. officially move into a sweat box. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Amy, uh, you can see Dustin. So Dustin uh, Hughes is our newest team member here and uh, Dustin, do you want to give sort of a little uh, preamp here of what where our conversation is going to be about tonight? Yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it about disclosures, as you said, disclose, disclose, disclose. There tends to be uh, whether it's black and white or a gray line, people don't know where they fall in terms of what needs to be disclosed. Mm-hmm. Yep, you just sound very echoey to us. So, can you just put your microphone more in front of you? Sorry about that. Um, And I don't know if that's because we have somebody in his office upstairs. Mark McNamara might be listening to voicemail messages. Just so you know, Mark, we can hear you down here. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's what's happening. Yeah, I think that that's what's happening a little bit too. Mark, you got in trouble. Yeah. Um, So, Amy, I know that you have taught the class for real estate agents. And I think the title of it was Disclose, 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 right? Right. Yeah. Um, So... Why don't we get right into it a little bit? And unless, uh, Dustin, do you have some first questions that you want to start rolling with this? So, Amy, just so you know, we do more of a roundtable type thing now. We sort of throw things out there and then just discuss them. So, absolutely. That's no, true. truthfully, what, what you mentioned, starting off with what you may or may not have been teaching, I, I feel lucky to be here. I'm almost like a guest. <laughs> the one, you want to learn a lot. Yes, Dustin. exactly. I, the one note. I have to take my class when I do it again. Yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. I love that. I can do that. Mm-hmm. So, Amy, why don't we just talk right from the beginning to all of our listeners? Again, we are on WATD. You are listening to Talk Real Estate Roundtable with uh, the McNamara Broker Team here at Boston Connect Real Estate. And we have Amy Huber- Hubert. I say it to Yes. Amy Hubert, Mass for Amy, yeah. Amy uh, from Sherman Law is all good. <laughs> yeah, Amy from Sherman Law out of <laughs> Hingham on with us today. And we are going to be talking about property disclosures. What has to be disclosed by the seller? What has to be disclosed... Um, 
um, by the real estate agent and what questions should buyers be asking when they are buying a property. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of different things that we do touch upon. I know there are some things, Amy, that we could probably have an entire show on. So we'll just briefly say lead paint and then mm -hmm. like we'll move on from that after we get to that so how do you want to start this little um this whole discussion i guess you know let's let's talk about different roles and how, how to approach it um you know there is the, the you know what the seller's responsibilities are what the buyer's due diligence is and kind of you know, how do we navigate that as, as real estate agents? So, um, you know, I guess I would start by talking about as a seller, if you're representing a seller, mm -hmm. uh, the first thing to do is to have a very honest conversation, um, going through the property first, actually finding out who owns the property. So lots of times we're dealing with estates or, or, you know, family members who are uh, representing elderly people and they might not know if they actually legally hold the property. So, you know, bare basics, do you own the property? Do you know um, the status of the property? Are you in active foreclosure? Are you, you know, again, these seem like extreme um, situations, but in the times that we are in, there are some people who are, are struggling in default. Um, and, you know, you want to be aware of that in terms of your timeline for, for a seller, for an agent. And mm -hmm. then it's, you know, um, there's what we have called seller disclosure forms. Mm -hmm. And there's always a debate among, among the real estate agents. Do we do them? Do we not do them? And, you know, here's yes. And, and that's, that is the form. Yep. Now, on the, on the one hand, it can protect you as an agent because you've asked the question, you've gotten the information and you're, you're, you're bound, you're bound by that. Um, but it is a situation that once you know, you know, you can't unknow something. Mm -hmm. Um, so that goes forward through, through all of the deals. Now, um, there are some things that are mandatory disclosure. Th these are, you know, I, I make a joke that it's like first date, Type, type of stuff. These are your deal breakers. Oh, you know? God, no. we heard a, a first date story from you. <laughs> Amy, Amy, don't tell any of our first date stories. <laughs> oh, God, geez, no, no, thank goodness. But these are the things that, you know, are bare bones structure of, of, of the relationship with the house, right? Structural things. Um, is there, uh, you know, is there a history of flooding in the property? Was there a fire in the property? Things that are, are, are known, uh, material defects to the property that might need to be disclosed. Um, and then there's, you know, there are these, there are these gray, gray areas that we'll, we'll get into um, mm -hmm. for sure. And then from a buyer's perspective, we are seeing, you know, more and more, we, I love that we're, you know, we're in Massachusetts, our real estate market is strong. Um, you know, we continue uh, to, to go through COVID with, you know, increased um, um, buying and selling and also, um, values and houses so we've been we've been very lucky you know and we're still aggressive as buyers that we do a lot of buyers have to waive inspections to stay competitive you know what does that mean for them what is the, what is the risk to that and you know a lot of first-time home buyers that's a very scary uh thing like you you know you don't you don't buy a car without test driving it you know and here we are the biggest investment mm -hmm. in our life and we're being asked to um to, to waive that inspection. So, you know, how do we coach them through through that process where they still get the information that they need as to, um, you know, to protect them in a purchase and sale and, um, you know, make them comfortable. So those are kind of the, the two sides of the coin. And mm -hmm. I will tell you that my answer changes depending on which, like a good lawyer, which hat I have on. If I'm representing <laughs> the seller, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say one thing. If yeah. I represent the buyer, I'm going to say another thing, all within the scopes of ethics and, and the law. You know, we, you cannot, the, the biggest thing I can tell you is fraud is fraud. It yeah. will, it is the one thing that will debunk your real estate license. It'll debunk your, your, uh, your, uh, my legal degree. It's, it is what it is. You have to answer things truthfully, but there's my biggest advice is you don't have to be the source of that information. You want to empower your buyer, if you represent the buyer, or the buyer's agent to seek out that information on their own. Because once you have that information, you are obligated to pass it on. Yes. And one of the things too is a couple of things and you've hit upon so many great things. And I promise you ladies and gentlemen out there, I will not hog the microphone tonight, but <laughs> 
in regard excited. yeah in regard to the you know the massachusetts seller statement of property condition you know the we use the mar forms here they've recent they've had to have changed this at some point because at one time the real estate agent had to sign this and that is why i primarily would not use them because right. i wasn't going to say if anything my client was saying was true or false i've never lived in the house right so i'm not going to say yeah everything he's saying is true he or she is saying right. it's true so that's why i didn't use them but right. the forms are very thorough and they are extremely helpful when you're a buyer's agent yeah as a buyer's agent we love to see them because that's providing you with all of the information that you essentially need for the house and if they're if the questions are being answered honestly can trigger you to do uh, more or further research mm -hmm. but um I just want I, I to find them people, to be accurate all like, the time. That's how I feel. Yeah. And that's why I just think they'll, like, I ask the questions and then I wait for home inspection. And when those questions come up, then I'll ask them again. But I just feel like nobody's going to put anything in here that's going to right. scare a buyer away. So why? Why? It's my analogy to the dating profile. It's like, <laughs> you know, are you, are you going to check everybody, you know, like, you know, oh, the roof does need to be replaced. <laughs> you know, it, it's a little leaky in the basement. You know, like these aren't things that we that we well, necessarily like, don't have. Uh, you, 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 the, a bald guy says, "I have a full head of hair." Exactly, you know? exactly. So, so, yeah, yeah. So we don't we don't try to set the expectation. So, you know, I think you need to know what is effective to market the properly property truthfully and ethically. Mm -hmm. um, you do not have to do. Uh, you know, you're not an engineer, you're not a structural engineer, you're not a plumber, you're not, you shouldn't be assuming roles that aren't yours. And I, I know I come from a family of real estate agents. You guys are the face of the transaction. They look to you to answer every question and to find out every detail, you know, from where do I get this done or who do I, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's very hard to stay out of that position, but it's really for your best protection. And, you know, I think having those conversations, it's it's like, you know, I, I'm full of analogies today, but it's like when you um, are a criminal defense attorney and you're sitting down with a defendant, you lay out like, this is what yeah. I need to know. If you tell me something outside the scope of that, I'm now bound by that, you know, and, and that's it. Not that we should treat our sellers like criminals or we should, but you need to know that, you know, certain questions are going to be asked of you and you need to answer truthfully, but, you know, we don't need to know about every uh, creek and cranny of the house. That's what the inspection's for. That's, you know, that's what's gonna, um, that's the buyer's due diligence. And what about questions that come up? And again, I'm sort of fast forwarding, but I'm just sort of curious, like questions that come up of the seller that the seller just doesn't want to answer. You right. know, let's just say that this is before an offer is accepted. So let's just say the seller is, at, um, the buyer buyer's agent comes to us as the seller's agent and says, my client is interested in knowing um, who every single one of the contractors were that did all of the work in this property. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then my seller comes back and says, hey, I was the person who did the, you know, I was basically GC in the whole thing. And I don't right. feel like it's really necessary. Is that a question that normally people would ask? Do they have to answer it? Is that I like, think, you know, I think it's you, not can, a disclosure. you can represent that, you know, work was done on the property by, um, by a con, you know, by a contractor, some by the owner of the house, that which, which the owner believed had to be permitted was done and you you know you're welcome to pull the permits yourself and see if there's any open permits so shift the burden you can say you know my my client you know worked to install a you know a kitchen in you know 2014 um you know it is not uncommon for uh, owners to do work on their property it's just whether or not it's substantial enough to raise us to a level of a permit now a lay person like an owner isn't going to know what is needed and per se and you say, you know, to the best of their knowledge, everything that that, that was done was done uh, to that standard. And you're entitled to your own home inspection to do your due diligence. If they opt to waive that home inspection, it is what it is. You know, mm -hmm. I do find that, um, you know, what, what bothers me sometimes is we go in with the buyers coming with an aggressive offer of I'm waiving everything. I'll do whatever you want. And then they come back with a list of, mm -hmm. well, I just want to know about this, 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 and this. And it's like, well, you're entitled to your home inspection. Now, is that outside the scope now of, um, you know, the, the standard disclosures? I think it is. I mm -hmm. think it is. That is inspectional issues. To me, standard disclosures are, you know, lead, 
asbestos, things that you, if you have actual radon. knowledge of yep. radon, you have to disclose. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a, it's up to the seller or the buyer to uh, to to seek that information. And you make such, I'm sorry, no, you no, make no. such a really good point too, Amy, is that, you know, as buyer's agents, I mean, Mary, you were at town hall today because we're representing a buyer. Yeah. You were at town hall yesterday, actually. Yeah. Was it yesterday or yeah. today? Yesterday. It's, they're all moving in together here. <laughs> um, but, you know, you went and we pulled the jacket as a buyer's agent and we find out, you know, what permits were pulled, what permits weren't pulled. If a new, if a brand new house is uh, built, then there should be all of the permits in there for the contractors that were used. So why would the buyer put that, you know, that responsibility onto the sell the seller's agent to find that information? If you want that information, go get it. If the seller doesn't want to give it to you, then just go find it yourself. Right. Now, like, the seller thinks you're annoying. The, who did the construction is not a mandatory disclosure. No. Yeah. You know, it's just whether it was done permitted and that's on the buyer to go and seek out uh, and find themselves. So, and, and that's, yeah. you know, that's my big takeaway is, you know, be, be the source of the source, not the source itself, you know, direct, direct the, uh, the individuals to find the information themselves, mm -hmm. especially, especially as a seller's agent that, yep. you know, that is, that is the key. And, you know, there's, you know, there's a reasonable, there's actually not a clear cut with the exception of like the big ones, lead, asbestos, environmental, things that are, you know, under the guidance of, of law, federal and state, there isn't a standard per se to the real estate agents besides the ethical standard, which is a reasonable reasonableness standard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you are acting with due diligence, you're acting with care. And I always say this, especially, you know, speaking with, with your new agent, you do have to think about your reputation and you do have to think about beyond that individual transaction. You know, I'm sure we all have had experiences. I've had experience with other lawyers, other agents where you think, okay, I see how this deal went down. I'll, I'll, I'll be careful next time. I'll, I won't take you at your word. I won't. So, you know, you have to think about your own longevity in, in the business as well. Um, yes, you represent your client and you do so, you know, zealously, um, but you can't be directed outside the bounds of your ethical obligations for your own professional uh, longevity. And that's, you know, I've been, I've been in this business for 20 years. I, you know, it's very important to me that people understand that when I say something that, you know, I, I can back it up. I, you know, I'm not a bluffer. I'm a, I, you know, I'm a zealous advocate and I'll dig in. I'm sure you, you guys have seen me on transactions. I'll dig in when I have to, yes. but um, that being said, I'm not, you know, I'm within, within the bounds of what's ethical because that is the longevity of your career. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And you know, one, go ahead, Mary, you, you talk, go ahead. I was just going to agree. That's all. Oh, okay. I'm looking at like the sun hitting your face. And, I know. Like, your I feel like, like I I'm, feel like you can't see. I can't see a thing actually. <laughs> so um, when did that all turn? We must be, getting, you know, another period. There we go. Yay. Better? Uh, yes. Um, so with the disclosures too is, you know, one of the things that I feel like sometimes we also have sellers who like, over over disclose every little thing and right. I was like, I really don't need to know that so let me just give you an example of something though that sometimes is a question of do we disclose this or we do not disclose that so if there is an issue let's just say uh, we go to somebody's home and they say to us we um, had mold and we had that remediated and we have a 10-year warranty that goes along with it so I, tell me how you would answer that because you know there are two different ways of looking at it yeah so there are two different ways of, uh, of looking at it you know for me I disclose if it's an ongoing issue or something that needed something like remediation I'm likely to disclose that you know and and where there's a warranty in place to me that you're always better off getting ahead of an issue and saying, especially if you have an inspection looming, saying, look, you know, yep, they had this issue. There's not a house in America that didn't have some water issue at some point, you know, that you know, a leak, a plumbing, it's it's a house, right? We got ahead of it, we did the, the remediation, here's the warranty that will be passed on to you. So to me, in that situation, I, I would. You know, I frequently have issues like, you know, do you get basement in the water? you know, water in the basement, um, basement, in the water. Yeah, do you get water in the basement. Well, no, I don't. 
unless it's, you know, six days of rain, you know, in 2012, I got, you know, some dampness. Now, is that something we need to, to disclose? You need to answer things truthfully, but it's a, to me, it's mandatory disclosures are chronic issues or things that, you know, weren't, weren't remediated, weren't, you know, resolved in the moment, ongoing concerns that are going to labor on in the property. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to have some, some sort of issue, you know, with a a toilet or this that, you know, it just goes to the daily maintenance of the property. Okay. So, but in that situation where there's a warranty, where there's a record of it as well, Mm -hmm. you know, to me, I would disclose that. Um, and I would sell it as look at my proactive buyer. They're very aware and they got, but you know, it is, it's a bit of a judgment call. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I I, I agree with that. I was going to ask what your other option was. Yeah. uh, well, well, the other side pe- is. well, sometimes people just don't and they wait for it to come up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there have been situations. Well, and that's the thing too. Like sometimes sellers will say to us, all right, because we will go into a house and I'll, I'm not a mold expert. I'm not an inspector. I'm not anything, but I too have been doing this for 20 years and, you know, I've been to a lot of home inspections. So I always sort of say to my seller clients, you know, if I'm up in the attic and just say, you know, I don't know for sure, but my guess is an inspector is going to come in here and probably assume that this is a mold-like substance. My suggestion to you is to get ahead of that because buyers are looking for what's wrong, not for what's right. Yeah, and right. everything is in thousand-dollar increments. So maybe it's going to cost you, you know, like let's just say twenty-five hundred to five thousand dollars to have it remediated. Well, the buyer is going to take ask for ten thousand off because right. oh my gosh, I have molds. Then they start researching. Yeah. So I always say get ahead of it and get it fixed. And I always say, like, they're going to see it, but then they say, okay, so once I have that remediated, do I have to say anything afterwards? And I always say, they're going to know. The remediation process is telltale. Yeah. So I feel if you don't tell, it makes it look like you're hiding a defect, which right. would make me as a buyer's agent, right, Mary, think, yeah. what else are you hiding? Like, right. do I have to look underneath every single little scatter rug to see if there's a crack in the tile, you know? Right. right. And I think that's, you know, that's real estate, that's human relationships. So I think if you're honest and forthright and get ahead of it and state it as, yep, this is, this is what it is. I think you're in a much better position. And honestly, if you have a buyer that's going to be digging deeper past that answer, they're going to dig deep on everything else. And Uh and at that point, you know, in this type of of, of seller's market, you know, it Mm -hmm. sometimes it's time to move on. You know, if that's, if that's going to be the stumbling block, there's probably going to be the other blocks as well. Mm -hmm. But you know, that is my biggest pet peeve um, is buyers who waive inspections and then kind of try to, you know, they, I get a rider lobbed over to me that says, you know, has anyone died in the house? Has anyone, you know, ever spray painted in the house? Has anyone ever, and you know, it's like, okay, let me get my red pen out, you know, buyers due diligence and waived, 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 you know, that's, that's a big issue. So um, that was big in Quincy, Mary, where we had a listing in Quincy. Remember that you were right on top of it, though. Remember it was, um, yeah, it was and they went to get Malden. Was no, it? no, they had one in Quincy too. Remember, we got the accepted oh, yeah, offer. Yeah, 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 yeah. They waived inspection, but then what they try to do is get in again before purchase and sales agreement with right. their friend, who's like a contractor or yeah. someone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And then they're trying to do the inspection within that ten time t- day period. Yeah, because yeah. then they they claim that they can get their money back, which mm-hmm. I don't think they should be able to personally. If you're going to violate the contract, will you just? That's mm-hmm. a breach of the contract, right? Uh, but at that and point, you're only holding a thousand dollars, and then yeah. you lost a week of marketing time or ten 100%, days. Hundred percent, but thousand right. right. dollars worth it? Yeah, I think so too. I guess, but yeah, um, no, it's it's. I mean, I agree, and and you know, a buyer should understand that. You know, we sometimes see um, you know inspections for informational purposes only. You know, and I, I don't know what your your thoughts on that is. You know. I have- um, she's know, not, <laughs> obviously, she's gonna be, I know she's not already. <laughs> yes, but usually, you know, it's the same sort of thing where we all of a sudden we see, you know, um, currents under, underneath uh, uh, coming through about issues with the property. Well, and that's what I say. Like for that one, when I, so when we do multiple offers, Melissa does such a great job of putting all of this information together for us. They're in a spreadsheet where I actually don't even have to look at the actual offers anymore because I'm looking at the spreadsheet and everything is just so like spot on. And I love that one that for informational purposes only. And what I explained to my client is, 
all right, it's for informational purposes only, but once they get that information, they're not saying that once they get that information that they're not going to bow out. Right. right. So that's the little piece in there that sort of bothers it's, me. Yeah. It's incredible. Right, right. Well, you can say there's little tricks in the game. You say, okay, you can do your inspection, but it's going to be after the commitment date. You yeah. know, at that point, you're going to have, you're going to have more skin in the game. Um, and the other thing with the informational purposes only is if you, as a seller, if that buyer walks, you now have that, that information. It's, it's the same potential damage, um, later down the line. So, um, and that's, you know, a, another thing as I have had the experience for sure, representing sellers where a buyer's agent will send me the whole, mm-hmm. you know, report and I'm like, return to sender, yeah. you know, I'm like, <laughs> what, what is it you're asking for? What do you like? We, you know, and, and we also all know that you can send a different inspector through a different property and they'll find different things, oh, you know? Yeah. Um, and, certainly uh you know as i like to caution my my young buyers too if you could go through a new construction house that should be you know and there though there will be something you know so it's all about really uh managing what their expectations are but um you know we brought up uh in you know some interesting things you know i'm sure you've gotten crazy questions like stigmatized properties you know has has anyone died in this house is, is a question you know has there been a crime in this house those are types of things that, you know, um, we see more and more in our, in our purchase and sales, believe it or not. And again, you know, you can direct them to the buyer's due diligence. But if you know, if you know something about a property, if someone asks you, um, you know, you are required to disclose what you know truthfully. So, um, Sorry to jump in. We just have a few more minutes until we have to take our seven o'clock break. But I do have a question about that stigmatized property. Um, I feel like there's sometimes a, a, a fine line um, when it comes to talking about a property when it's somebody who has never lived in the house. So right. perhaps it's a neighbor or somebody mm-hmm. like, you know, everybody has Google. Everybody can, you know, Google any address and maybe find out the history um, behind there. So, you know, and, and a lot of we we've gotten this question before and, and a lot of people um, have this idea that you have to disclose if somebody dies in the house and stuff like that. So it, those aren't necessarily defects of the house. So right. do we really have to disclose that or is it only if somebody asks us? If someone, I, you know, that's really like, I, I don't disclose unless I, you know, if I know, if, if you know, if someone was murdered in the house and it's public knowledge and people know about it, and someone asks you about it and you know, I, I think you have an obligation to, to disclose it. Um, but you know, if- um, But is it a moral obligation or a legal obligation? It's, I think it's if, I think if you conceal it, it's it's mm-hmm. almost like concealing it, you know? Mm-hmm. So if, if someone says to you, is this the same house as, you know, this double homicide happened? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you could say- It was, you know, uh, you, know, <laughs> you can say, um, you know, yeah, I would say, you know, um, you, you know, you should look, you should, you, you should look up the address, you know, or, or if you have actual knowledge, I, I think you have to say yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, if it is. Ask, but it isn't like we put in MLS, like beautiful, right. you know, 100%, you, know, you have to wait. <laughs> it's don't ask, don't tell, you know, sort of thing. And, um, you know, uh, also, also with like SORB registries, sex offenders, things like that. I get all the, the fun topics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we actually had an issue at a house uh, in um, Milton, where I'm from, where a, uh, you know, a sex offender can write down whatever address for mm-hmm. their parole. They just, you know, they write it down. It wasn't their address. And this property, like when they went to go sell, it came up as being, you know, a, a sex offender lived there not the case, not anything, it had to be all done, but the impact to that house, mm-hmm. on that, well, that was resolved was significant, you know? So you have to, you have to do your due diligence and you have to be, you have to be aware. So I'll be at Emptor or something. Emptor. Buyer beware. Buyer beware. But I don't like that. Absolutely. I don't, I don't like the has anybody passed away in this house question. It really kind of, well, I guess if there's a homicide or a suicide. Or, or something that My was... My mom suggests, ask, did the first 48 film at this house? <laughs> <laughs> Liz, you also, a, a, you know, an you. owner can only answer to what their knowledge is. If they've owned the house for the past five years, you know, they can say, well, during, I, I love, you gotta, you gotta cover it. During the time of my ownership, well, yeah. you know, 
Has yeah. there ever been a, a, an underground oil storage during the time of my ownership? No, you know, so limit that, limit that scope. Yeah, and I love that, Amy. And I know we have to break pretty soon just for our seven o'clock top of the hour break. But um, that's what I feel one of the things with my experience and being in this business for so long that I think that I do a really good job at, and Mary and Melissa can tell me differently, is I do always say, um, so like one time we had a situation with, you know, what was atta- what was considered attached Fixtures. and not a fixture and what Our wasn't. Property. And when I looked at it, I was like, I would assume that it is, but I don't know for sure what the seller's thoughts are on this. So let me check with the seller to see what their thoughts are. Because based on what the rule is, it's attached with a screw. So that that's what the law says, right? If it's glued, right. screwed and whatever, that, that it is. But I said, I always follow up with, let me verify with the seller. Or right. you know what yeah. the seller st- stated to me, because like I said, I've never lived in the house and I'm not making it. I'm not deciding if a whale tail is staying or not, you (laughs) know, whale tail hook is staying, you know, and, and document, 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 you know, that conversation always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think Ben, are we ready for our top of the hour or do you want us to continue on here for a minute? Yeah, no, we can send it right along. I can't understand the thing you're saying. Yeah, 7 o'clock break. So we're going to break for a few minutes, um, and we will be right back with Amy Hubert Masferrer. And (laughs) phone number at WATD, where Ben is, 781-837-4900, 781-837-4900. If you have any questions in regard to real estate, we have one of the best of the best here with us tonight as a real estate attorney. She's so super smart. She knows all the ins and outs of this. She's been doing it for 20 years. Um, So if you have any questions for Amy or for us, just call Ben and he'll pipe you through 781-837-4900. You can catch us live on Facebook, which is uh, Sharon Costa McNamara or any of the Pembroke Connects and Dork, what all of the pages, right? All the pages. 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 So we'll be right back. Sorry about that, Ben. (laughs) No worries. WATD FM Marshfield, WMEX Quincy. This is the South Shores Radio Station, 95.9 FM WATD. Streaming online at 95.9WATD.com and with your smart speaker just by saying play WATD. AP News, I'm Jackie Quinn. President Trump says the nation will recover from the coronavirus pandemic, but things could get worse before they get better. He's joined the medical experts who've been calling for social distancing and wearing a face mask. We're asking everybody that when you are not able to socially distance, wear a mask, get a mask. Uh, Whether you like the mask or not, uh, they have an impact, they'll have an effect, and we need everything we can get. The president says the federal government sent military personnel to Texas and other hot spots where virus cases are on the rise. Louisiana's governor is keeping virus restrictions in place, reporting more than 1,500 patients were hospitalized today. Health officials say their capacity is being strained. Florida's governor is refuting doctors' claims that they are out of ICU beds. We have a number of hospitals who are part of a larger system who may only have a few uh, ICU beds in that particular hospital, but system-wide, there would be a lot of capacity, and Advent is one example. President Trump was asked during his virus briefing about the capture of alleged sex conspirator, Gillian Maxwell. I don't know. I haven't really been following her too much. I just wish her well, frankly. Uh, I've met her numerous times over the years, especially since I lived in Palm Beach, and I guess they lived in Palm Beach, uh, but I wish her well. Whatever it is, uh, I don't know the situation with Prince Andrew. Just don't know. Not aware of it. A Minnesota judge has lifted a gag order in the case against four former officers charged in the death of George Floyd. The judge says he will consider a request to make more body camera footage available. A former Old Dominion University student who targeted his school with a fake bomb threat so he could skip class is pleading guilty to a swatting conspiracy that encompassed a neo-Nazi leader and others who targeted a black church. Stocks were higher today. This is AP News. Good evening. Yes, all weather is local. And while the Boston area had its first heat wave of the season, ending yesterday for the most part after reaching 90 on Saturday and then that steam heat Sunday and yesterday, Plymouth had the first heat wave the last few days with 
More of a westerly breeze that included the Upper Cape today. Tonight will turn out comfortably mild, fair, low of 67. Tomorrow, more clouds moving in. A high of 83, though it will be cooler along the coast with an onshore breeze, a bit of mist, a brief shower, and that humidity really increasing tomorrow night into Thursday in the upper 60s to near 70 for a low temperature, mid and upper 80s, reaching that steam heat level. It'll feel closer to the mid 90s on Thursday. Even a heavy thunderstorm around that could contain some locally flooding downpours and damaging wind gusts late in the day. Friday will start to dry out. Some early clouds will give way to sun. A high of 83, cooler at the beach. And then this weekend looks really nice. Starting a little less humid Saturday with sun in the low 80s. For WATD, I'm meteorologist Rob Gilman. Hi, this is Mike McNamara. Our show, McNamara on Money, has been on the air here on WATD since 1990. Wow. Go figure. Well, you can catch us on Saturday mornings from 8 to 10, and now you can catch us on Sunday mornings from 7.30 to 9.30. We promise to make it worth your while. Call us on the South Shore at 781-834-2010 or in the Merrimack Valley at 978-256-7447. We now return to Talk Real Estate, sponsored by Boston Connect Real Estate Services on 95.9 WATD. Back with all my social Shore neighbors. This is Sharon McNamara, and you are, of course, listening to Talk Real Estate with Sharon McNamara and the McNamara Broker Team. And uh, we are here tonight discussing disclosures. Disclose, 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 everybody. Um, And we have Amy Hubert Massafarier. I always say mass for air. So that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so we have her. I have to, um, we were just talking about stigmatized um, homes. And one of my favorite ones that I've heard, so we were just talking about, do we have to disclose if somebody has died in the property? My favorite question is, are there ghosts in the house? How do I answer that? I don't see ghosts. <laughs> Maybe are there ghosts in the house? Like if you believe in that sort of thing. Right. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, a a lot of that, can you guys hear me? Okay. Too? Cause I'm having a little hard time hearing you guys, but I didn't hear it. Like we couldn't hear ourselves either. So, but I did hear either ghosts in the house, or at least I think I did. I hope that wasn't (laughs) ghosts. So, That's what I said, yep. Right. Um, during your home inspection? Yeah, right. I, I mean, you know, again, we are not, you know, conjurer of spirits. We're not required to, to go to go through this. Now, if there, for instance, yes, for instance, though, if it's a known haunted house and it's been, you know, publicly known that way, you, again, you don't have to answer any question, but if you have direct knowledge, you can't defraud by, by lying about it. And that, and that goes the same with, you know, the stigmatized property. Has anyone died here? Has anyone, has there been a murder here or a crime here? So Mm -hmm. if you don't know you, you, or if you have no direct knowledge, but if you have direct knowledge, you have to relay that. So I I think, you know, that look for houses like that. There's a buyer pool for that. (laughs) Oh, there is. There is. I mean, you know, grandma rattling around in the basement, you know, maybe (laughs) is different than, you know, they, you know, they charge admission, you know, in Salem witch trials and, you know, it's public knowledge and people know, and you've been asked this question, is this the same house that, and you know it, you have to answer. You can't, you can't lie, but, um, you do not have to, um, put yourself out there. So you get, you kind of have to, you have, you have to dance, dance that line a little bit. So at what point do like, where does our investigation as agents sort of stop for, you, you know, I'm sort of talking about an agent perspective right now more so, but I, I, you know, for us protecting our buyers as well though. So let's just say somebody came to us and asked us about something that should be disclosed. We'll just use right now. Has anybody ever died in this house? Yep. Yeah. We go back to the seller and what, whatever this disclosure issue is, right? Has anybody ever died in the house? We go back to our seller client and we say, the buyer is asking if anybody has ever died in this home. And they lie to us. So they yeah. say, no, nobody has. But they know that somebody has, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know for sure. And I have to trust my clients that they're giving me the full information. That's true. I then go back to the buyer's agent and say, I did speak with the seller. According to the seller, nobody has died in this home, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. 
So then the, the buyers move in and they find out somebody did die in the house. The neighbor across the street comes running across the street and says, hey, somebody died in this house. Did you know that? Who, like, what happens there? Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, well, you were supposed to disclose that. You should have known. And, well, how would I know? Do I have to then, you know, do I have to Google the property address? Do I no. have to do the investigation? No. And, you, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should, you know, if there's a question that the buyer wants to answer that's in the in the realm of reasonableness, you know, then um, you have to rely on what the seller says. And it's, it's if the buyer doesn't want to accept that it's their obligation to to investigate in and of them of themselves mm -hmm. and um you know that that's if it's something that that is that important to them they should find out you know um so i in terms of any litigation or anything like that you would you you can only relay what information you know you mm -hmm. you're not required to dig through every inch of this property know everything you know it's that's not your obligation to you you are required to answer truthfully what you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's certain things like representations you know, that, that I do, you know, recommend. Say if you're, uh, and this was, you know, this was a large case in Hingham. Say your client is representing to you um, that the property is for commercial use, you know, and you as a knowledgeable real estate agent look around and see only residential properties around you. Do I think before you put in MLS that it's zoned for commercial use that you should verify that independently? I do. But that's that's in a scope of your everyday business transaction world, right? The court would look at you and say, well, you have some knowledge of this, right? You live in the area. You've never seen a business in this area. So things like, things like that is your realm of knowledge. Whether someone died or, you know, there's, you know, that that's not that's not something you're going to know um, from a business sense, you know, and, and that's where I, where I kind of draw the, draw those lines. In that one with the permitting too, if you want to, you know, talk about that case a little bit more, I know you, you've talked to us about it several times, but I know that sometimes it actually happens the opposite way where people are assuming, okay, you're in, you're in, I almost said downtown Pembroke. <laughs> Downtown, downtown. Yeah, so we're like in you know Pembroke Center that you would assume that okay the house next door would be commercial zoned. I see agents making this mistake all the time because there mm -hmm. is a big difference between being commercially zoned, business zoned, or mixed use zone. Right. So you know, is it residential A? Is it residential B? Like all of these different things. And again, I was on zoning board, so I, I feel a little more privy to that type of stuff. I was on conservation. Um, I think that agents have to make themselves smarter and and yeah. get educated so they they don't make those mistakes but i see it all the time like i i recently saw something that said that um there's an um an apartment over the garage that can bring in additional um income, income. Yeah. Right. and it's like no like you can't rent it it's not a two family right so, right things yes and it, you know to me if you're putting it in mls you're standing by those representations so you know um I think you have to be very careful in, in that regard, you know, versus if you had just, if they, you know, say you had marked that property as a traditional residential property and the person says, well, I see there's kind of like an apartment upstairs. Do you know, blah, blah, blah. You can say, well, you would have to, you would have to verify that independently, right? You can answer that truthfully. But if you would put, put it out there independently that that is a, uh, you know, habitable rental space you know zoned properly then you're standing by that representation and that and that's the difference you know so you want to be very careful that anything you put in M mls is true and accurate you know sometimes we say you know roof approximately this age that that's understandable things but you know if if it's uh something that's you know by ordinance by by law you need to be able to substantiate it um, Amy, I have a question. So I, I'd love your opinion on this. So something that comes up, um, you know, as a listing agent or as a buyer's agent is, is pools. And especially in the wintertime when you can't inspect them right. or they're closed, uh, you know, even in the summer, if the seller chooses not to open the pool um, because they're selling, so they don't want to, you know, incur the cost. Um, so question, if the seller knows that or might not know that there's something wrong with the pool. Um, right. or they're claiming that they don't have any knowledge that there's something wrong with the pool, but 
you know, the buyer moves in and they open the pool. It's very noticeable that there's something wrong with it. Um, you know, obviously they couldn't inspect the pool during their buying process, but the um, listing agent went to the seller, asked if there's anything wrong with the pool. They said no. Then right. the listing agent goes back to the buyer's agent and says, oh, you know, they don't have any no knowledge of anything wrong with the pool, but something is. So who is yeah. liable for that? Right, right. And it's, and that's tricky thing. So if I represented the seller, you know, I would say, you know, look, you know, you knew that you couldn't inspect it. We, you knew that when you submitted the, the offer the, dur during the time of the year, we represented that at the time that we closed the pool, that it was still functioning. And it, and it was, you know, you're kind of on your, on your own. Now, if I was a buyer and this actually just happened to one of my clients, um, I will say to him like, look, you're not going to be able to inspect this till spring. You know, are you ready that if this pool doesn't work, you know, how, how, how invested is, is this a deal breaker for you? Because then I want to go back to the seller and say, okay, we can't inspect this. So we're going to reserve that. We're going to say that, you know, either we're asking for a $10,000 hold back pending the, um, you know, the opening of the pool, um, the testing of the system, trying to negotiate that. Um, or if they won't agree to that, that, you know, a separate agreement that if there's, if the property is inspected and, you know, the pool isn't functioning, that they agree to pay up to $5,000 to get it to a functioning level. You have to kind of think creatively depending on who you're representing and what protection you can, you can offer them. In my opinion, if, if an MLS, and this was my argument with my client, with the client where I represented the buyer, you sold the property with a functioning pool, the property, the pricing of the property was incorporated into that. So if you can't, you know, if that isn't what is presented, then there's a cost in, involved with that. And we had to negotiate um, a holdback agreement at that point um, to cover the inspection. Cause lo and behold, when they opened up the pool, there were lots of problems. Mm -hmm. So we had that money in place, but you know, it's, it's all about everything is negotiable and you know, it depends. Is it a hot property that there's multiple buy buyers in line and your buyer doesn't have much of an argument. They're going to say, you know, we'll move on to the next buyer. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, if it's something um, where it, where the seller is a little bit more motivated and they know, then you have to discuss some protections for your client. And in some point uh, places too, I would guess that the seller feels like if I closed my pool and, uh, you know, I would be like, yeah, it was functioning perfectly fine. I would have no problem unless I needed that money to go on to my next purchase. Yeah. Right. I would be like, all right, fine. If you want to hold back $10,000, like I feel pretty confident that it's going to be okay and I'll get that money afterwards, but I would want it right. with interest again, negotiations, right? Not the $10,000, but you know, yeah. I'm th sort of thinking what your clients would think, right. but I also need to open the pool too. Yeah. So if it's... You well, remember if you can't open it until May. Yeah, well, anything but, can happen. You, right. you know, uh, anything. Well, and here's the, here's the thing where like as is clauses, when you sign a purchase and sale and it says, you know, you're acknowledging you've had your inspection, you've done all this stuff. If there's a pool, I'm going to exempt it from the as is, is clause. I'm going to say, accept this because I didn't get to do my inspection. If, you know, the if the pool gets open and it's in such incredible disrepair that it's clear that it's not just a, uh, you know, wear and tear type of thing, then that's active fraud. And that's when you get into experts and you say, well, the pool guy opened it up and says, this is clear, it's clear this pool has been dormant for the past seven years. You know, it's a cesspool. Like that's a different story than, you know, we have, you know, it's, it, you know, the pump's not working or, you know, I'm not a pool person. So, um, but you know, there's ways to tell. Like in an air conditioner, that's the same thing where you can't test them in the winter, but sometimes right. mice get in, you know, sometimes people put covers over them mm -hmm. and mice get in there and chew at the wires. So when you go to put it on, it doesn't work. So that's, right. that could normally happen, but you know, having, you know, a swamp in your backyard because it hasn't been right. Open. Something that's not going to take, oh, you know, isn't a seasonal, like, you know, it, it showed disregard and you, you offered it as this pool, you know? So, so I want you to flip your hat. Now flip your hat and you're against right. yourself right now. What are you saying as a seller's agent? If I'm a seller on the pool? And yeah, you just requested a, a $10,000 hold back or up to right. $5,000. Now how are you acting as a seller's agent? A seller's so agent. I, I would say, you know, if I was a seller's agent, again, everything's negotiable. If they've waived inspection, I, I'll say that's inc inclusive of the property. You know, um, I understand there's not an opportunity to do that, but to hold out that, that it's an you know, it's an, an amenity to the house. It's not, you know, something structural, something that, 
has a mandatory disclosure and it's, you know, it's to the best of my knowledge, which I, I disclose to you. And right, you know, here, here's the biggest thing. I don't own the property anymore. You decided to go forward with the sale and you recorded the deed. It's, it's your, it's your property. Unless something was negotiated in the purchase and sale. Otherwise, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, buyer beware. I love that, like, you know, when you're saying that you can be two hats. So now, like, yeah. I used to do that, but now I have Mary. Uh, yeah. and, then have, and then we have Melissa that's, like, sort of the mediator in between. And right. But it must be nice being able to sort of have a dual personality there. Yeah. <laughs> well, it comes in handy. I keep my kids on, on their toes, you know. I'm like, I, you know, um, it, it's funny, like, uh you know, my, one of my kids is very big into like debate and stuff. And that's one of their trainings is to, they have to flip to either side at any point. And part of it is also training that you always have to know the other person's perspective. Mm -hmm. Part of it's strategic, but you know, it's a, it's a good lesson in empathy too. If you can see both sides of an argument, if you're really truly negotiating, you know, to get to some middle ground, you have to be able to see both sides. So and that's one of the things that I say when I go to somebody's house as, you know, when I'm doing my first initial CMA appointment and, you know, comparative market analysis, yeah. I always say to them, you know, because I'm, I am going to be pointing out things and I don't want them to think that I'm sort of, you know, saying bad things about their home. Yeah, so I all, picking I'm picking the house. the house apart. I always say, I walk through your home as the eyes of a buyer because buyers are looking for what's wrong, not for what's right. I'm only point, pointing these things out. Right. So. We, and a lot of times too, I might say like, oh, I noticed that steam. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? And they, they have a really good answer. Oh, the kids were playing in the tub and, you know, the water came down the side and underneath the tile. So I know the answer. So I right. think it's better to know so you can, you know, discuss it when it does come up. So right. Mel, did you have another question there? Um, I did, but I lost my train of thought. Oh, sorry, because we were no. talking about the pool, so that was a good one. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about um, a couple things because we have 10 minutes left. So let's talk about hearsay or let's talk about rumors or let's talk about things that may not be true or could be true. And this goes back to like how much how much um, due diligence do I have to do to try to investigate these things? I love that you said none. But, you know, a neighbor makes a statement. So right. let's just say a neighbor sends me as an agent, uh, an email and says, Hey, I noticed that you're listing this house across the street. It's a private road. And we have, have been having issues with, you know, water trickling down. And, you know, we think that this is a concern house is newer. So then you bring it to, I go to the seller and I say neighbor across the street. And, oh, and I, my response actually CCs the seller and says, you know, I, you know, unfortunately I don't have anything to do with these types of neighborly type conversations. Um, I'm not sure if the seller is aware of it. She is now CC'd on this. So like, I just feel like, okay, so if there's some water coming down the drain, like at what point do you have to say everything like a neighbor makes up something because she's not happy right. with the way water flows, but like the house yeah. was just built. So all the permits were pulled and you have an occupancy permit. Like, right. do I have to now get an engineer out there to say, okay, the water's going the right way? No, no. And you know, we see this a lot with neighbors who all of a sudden see that the people are about to move and they're like, well, oh my gosh, like, you know, there was, I think that piece of property is mine or there's boundary dispute. Let's raise it now because before the new neighbors come in, we want to resolve it type of thing. No, I mean, I think that's stuff that, that falls under the scope of, of general inspection. That neighbor's certainly not an, not an expert. You're offering the property to, um, to it's open to the buyer can inspect or not inspect. And it's, and it's to the seller's knowledge. If the seller had direct knowledge of that situation themselves, you know, you know, maybe that's, a, maybe that's an issue. You mm -hmm. know, I just had a deal where um, a neighbor came in as the property was about to be sold and was like, oh, by the way, their driveway has been on my land for the past 10 years. No big deal, but I kind of want to address it. Now, he didn't have any documentation. He didn't have anything, but you're also dealing with the real, real world problem that the minute the new person moves in, that neighbor's going to ding dong and say, I let them know. So it's, you know, what you have to do and what you probably have to do to avoid a bigger problem later is, you know, I let them know. I said, you know, this neighbor is saying this, he's not disputive. He's, he's saying he'll, he'll resolve it if it's an issue. But the reality is 
we bought the property with this plot plan and this survey. We have no knowledge of it. You know, it's just kind of his speculation about it. And then they can make, they can make their decision. Um, because what you have to do and what could, you know, snowball into a bigger problem later down the line, you have to think about too, you know, uh, you might be able to win a case, but you want to litigate over it is the, is the question, you know, sometimes. And that's how, you know, Mary and I and Melissa, our team and Justin, we actually had the situation that recently came up. And, you know, um, in the meantime, what happened in the process of these emails was that my father-in-law passed away. So um, the day of the services, Mary was at my house watching the dog. And um, she's like, oh, Melissa's at the office. She got a certified letter today with the emails that you were having corresponding with the neighbor. And I was like, all right, well, I, I don't have anything to hide. Like I, I right. sent off. I, I actually checked with brad mahoney who was yep. uh, knows the seller by the way and used yeah. brad and um they said you know i didn't have to disclose anything but the next morning when i woke up i was like she's definitely setting something up to cause you know to cause an issue or to make a point even maybe she wasn't trying to cause a problem just to make a point right so and i had a, a very lengthy conversation we were told from several attorneys and several people that we did not have to disclose anything because i didn't have anything in my hand that said okay this is causing a water problem right it's speculation exactly but yeah. one of the things i thought about was could this information potentially change the buyer's decision if they want to purchase this home or not? And right. that's where I struggled. So right. Mary and I decided collaboratively that we will tell, that right. we should disclose it regardless if we have to or not. So I did. We brought it to them, fully disclosed it. It was the day that they were moving in, but not the day they were closing because that was another right. whole you know, they, it was a Friday and they were closing on a Monday. So they didn't have to move in. They didn't have to close papers. They could have brought something up if they thought it was an issue. But I was right. The neighbor yeah. came across the street with all of those emails and said, I told your, the real estate agent of the seller that she had to disclose this to you before you moved in. Right. I to the buyer's agent. Whether the buyer's agent told the client or not, I don't know. Right, so, right. Yeah, and that's, that's, you know, that's a legal problem. You know, again... Were you completely acting in the scope if you didn't, it didn't tell? Yes, you were. But that, you know, litigation is brought on a question, you know, it's, it doesn't mean that it's the truth. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't resolve. So I think sometimes you have to make those sort of professional judgment calls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there was a case in Massachusetts, I talk about my disclosure um, class where, you know, a, a young couple moves in, they're sitting on the front steps and um, the listing agent is, is you know, or, I'm sorry, the listing agent is sitting on the front steps. She's waiting for the young couple to do their final walkthrough. And, um, you know, the neighbor, the nosy neighbor comes over and was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad this young couple, came, you know, is moving in. You know, this place used to be a real dump. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know. They really fixed it up. And she's like, no, this is like, this was the dump. This was the town oh, dump. Oh, my God. And so the listing agent didn't say anything. You know, it's an environmental issue. Sure enough, the young couple move in, have a baby. They're planting their little organic garden, and they're digging up carburetors, and they're digging up, mm. you know, that was a different. She had some, that's a question. She had some 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 knowledge, you know, at, at that point. Um, you know, she wasn't found legally uh, liable because she could, it wasn't something she could verify in the moment or anything. But, you know, she got dragged into that litigation because there was there was a question mark. And that that's the big question I think everyone asks and I think the courts look at, too. Would this have substantially changed the buyer's mind had they had that information? That's that reasonable standard that we talk about. You know, is a young couple going to, you know, expecting a baby going to purchase a property on a dump? Probably not. That is a substantial <laughs> issue. That is a substantial <laughs> issue. I'm surprised. But, you know, and, and that's the other thing with that, you know, as a listing agent, a seller, you know, steer clear of those, those, um, those inspections. When you're, when your client says, oh, I really want you to stay on the property. You know, I get nervous. I want to see what they say. Kind of needs, no, you don't, you don't want to know. You don't want to know what's going on. You don't want to hear it because once you know, you can't unknow. So, um, it's just, it's just something to think about. And we even say that too, with our sellers, you know, sadly with the, with COVID, we don't have, we don't have our agents right now really at closings very much and sellers, you know, for a long time, haven't been coming because of those reasons, you know, we sit down and the lovely older couple who's so sweet, who just wants to tell the new buyers all about their house and inevitably 
you know, let's go of every leaky pipe in the house and, you know, with the best of intentions, but you know, it's just, you, you, there's, there's times and places of, of those conversations at, at that stage. So, um, with your about, with the reasonable standard, I think, is that maybe a question is that as a listing agent, you know, because I want to do the right thing for the buyers as well. I mean, I honestly, I always say this. I'm not going to walk through stop and shop, any stop and shop and, and duck in the produce aisle because somebody feels like they got screwed by Sharon McNamara or Boston. Right. Person, right? Yeah. So I just feel like, is that a question that's fair for us to ask our, our clients, you know, as we're sitting down, like, okay, like the age of the roof, blah, blah, blah. Is there anything, any known defect or any information about this house that you feel would make a difference for somebody if to purchase it or not? Because maybe that right. dump thing would have came up. I mean, is right, that a right. to ask? I mean, I think you stick to what has to be disclosed because that, when you leave it in that sort of gray area, you know, what you know, what is some people's dump might be some people's treasure, you know, like you just don't know. But I think saying, do you, you know, do you have any knowledge of, you know, uh, has the property ever been tested for radon? You know, do you have any knowledge of asbestos? Do you have any knowledge, you know, the, the, like I said, those, those first date deal breakers, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, not the, uh, you know, someone once, once, once told me you have to, you show somebody who they are, but just not all at the same time, you know, <laughs> which is a problem I struggle with, you know, that I'm, I'm very open and very, you know, with my communications, but you know, you, you lay out the parameters of, you know, this is, this is the property and it's, and it's structurally bare bones, you know, meets legal requirements, the gray areas, you know, you're going to get into some trouble things. That's when you're going to hear, well, you know, my grandma on occasion turns on a light, you know, you don't want to, hear about ghosts you don't want to hear it. so I, I I don't think that's the best question but I do think sometimes when you're talking to sellers and they're very you know animated or angry about a question that a buyer asks to pull it back to that reasonable stand, standard and say you know look I understand you've lived in this property for your entire life and this has never ever been an issue this is a very young new buyer who's looking at it, you know, from a different perspective. And I know those are very different perspectives, but it's not necessarily unreasonable that they're asking, you know, um, about, you know, you know, the water or this or, you know, and, and trying to, to create some some dialogue there. Um, it's tough because sometimes, you know, some some deals are very open and other deals are, you know, it's the north and the south. You know, it's just it's just how people look at things is very different. Yeah. And I do love that whole thing about like the empathy and the perspective. And that's one of the big things that we've been, uh, it, Mackenzie actually teaches a class at Clemson and she taught it to, to our class one, uh, to our office. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah. It was awesome too, because, you know, there's the person that's, you know, sitting on the island, like, you know, that's been stranded out there and sees a, a rowboat and he's like a boat. And then there's a guy in the boat that's been stranded in a rowboat that sees the island and says an island like land, you know what I mean? So. Right. It's the perspective of how right. you're taking right. it. It's, you know, it's, it's based on it's, need. Oh, it's 7.31. Ben, would you have us until 8 or 7.30? Uh, it was my understanding 7.30, but we're rolling with it. Okay. So um, I guess that will just sort of wrap up now if we um, can take a couple more minutes, Ben, if that's okay. By um, all means. So, Amy, we could go on and on and on about this topic because there are so many other things. As you're sitting here talking, I'm thinking about, you know, the one time where I asked an agent before I showed the house, you know, um, I, the, the area where you are is very low. Has you ever had any water? No, no, no water. But we showed up on the day it was pouring and we went to the basement and there was probably, I don't know, a, a foot of water. And I just looked at my buyer client and said, well, I guess the fishing is free. Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. lie about certain things. I know. It's like, you know, and that's, that's the thing. No pun intended, but things come to the surface. They do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, yeah. And, and I, and I think that, you know, I think it's saying to a, to a seller, look, is there something, you know, that we, if there's anything I need to get ahead of here, you know, that you have, is there something you have concerns about? You know, one of the things, um, I have sometimes sellers call and say, should I do a pre-inspection mm -hmm. to, you know, find out about the property, see what the, but, you know, see what my condition of the property is. And, you know, I say, I don't know what your opinion is, no, because again, once you know, you know. Mm -hmm. I think if there's known issues with the property that you know you have to correct and that are gonna be addressed, like you said, better to fix it now instead of pay twice, you mm -hmm. know, 
uh, in a possible renegotiation. But, you know, it does, in, in some instances, knowledge is not power for the seller. You know, they think if they know about it, they'll be able to diffuse the buyer coming mm -hmm. in where, you know, that, that's not always the case. Well, and one of the things too, Amy, with that though, is there are times where I have clients, actually I'm working with somebody right now that would, you know, very OCD, wants everything to be perfect, that I would suggest if that's going to make you feel better, because right. let's be honest, they're gonna, there's going to be a home inspection done. So if you want to get ahead of those things. So I think that that's sort of the prevailing question is, okay, do you want to have it done? Are you, if you do have that done, are you prepared to make the repairs and disclose Correct. what comes yes. up with it? So right, absolutely. Think, yeah. So, yeah. well, again, we could go on and on and on. I love you to pieces. Um, oh, you too. Everybody. Well, it's to see you guys in a, in a distant sort of zoomy way. But. <laughs> <laughs> can you give everybody, our WATD listeners, our Zoom listeners, and our Facebook listeners and watchers, can you give them your contact information so they can reach out to you if they need? Of course. Yeah. I mean, the most direct way to reach me, I'm, you know, I'm always a mobile unit, is my cell phone, which is uh, 617 504 nine one five one and uh, my email i'm at tim sherman law at 175 derby street in hingham and it's a h m for my current initials amy hubert mass Frere at tim sherman law.com perfect so i'm you know happy to take any calls to as uh as you guys need it or for anything pops up shoot me an email and i'm happy to address it well, Amy, thank you so much. I sent you an email or a text message this afternoon, and here you are like four hours later. So I thank you for that. <laughs> I'm a last minute girl. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. Last time yeah. to prepare, right? Yes, uh, exactly. Thank you to all our WATD listeners. You were, again, listening to Talk Real Estate with uh, the broker team here at Boston Connect Real Estate. And we, um, if you have any past shows, you want to help people? Yeah, if you want to listen to any of our past shows, you can go to talkrealestateroundtable.com. You can go to your podcast app and search us. Mary's laughing at me. No, <laughs> um, I have my voice. Um, you can go to bostonconnect.com. You can give us a call here at the office, 781-826-8000. And I will get you in touch with anybody you want to talk to. Yes, and we will be back next week. No idea what the topic is yet, but I'm sure that Dustin will fill us in at some point. So we'll see everybody next week. Thank you, Amy. All right. Good to see you Bye. guys. Take care. Bye-bye. ATD FM Marshfield, WMEX Quincy. This is the South Shores Radio Station, 959 FM WATD. Streaming online at 959WATD.com and with your smart speaker just by saying play WATD. On your retirement and retirement outlook. And lastly, which is a fun one, I think, is uh, seven you know, common beneficiary mistakes, mm. which I find all the time. I see people when they come in and every single I'm, a person I meet with, we do a beneficiary review. So it's not just on accounts that I am going to handle for you, but we look at all your accounts uh, elsewhere, your 401k, that type of thing to see how you have it set up. And you would be surprised, Eileen, how many people have it uh, set up in a, a way that's very unintentional, meaning not what they intended. Mm -hmm. And uh, if something had hap happened to them, uh, their wishes would not be met because it's going to people that they're not looking the money to go, you know, to go to. Yeah, I find that, you know, you say you start a new job and you list your beneficiary for your, you know, uh, life insurance and for your 401k and um, then you forget about it for 15 years while you're working and your life changes. So th these are things that people really need to pay attention to and make adjustments along the way. And uh, this is something that Chris can help you out with. And I encourage you to give him a call at 508-659-5849. That's 508-659-5849. Or go to his website, caperetirementradio.com, where you can download complimentary, no cost, uh, this, this retirement plan.